I had a strange dream. I was walking through a golden temple beneath a dome of glass and through chambers of splendor filled with so many objects that the heart so desires. I saw miracles of human skill and artistry and flawless beings who seemingly lacked nothing. But it appeared they were all searching for something. Such strange creatures. The whole world is in a big mess. The more they get, the more they want. President Bush, after 9-11, said, I urge all Americans to go shopping. This brain would still make me money. It's the thing in me. I grew up in a way that I would still make money, even if I was left in the desert. There is somebody who tries to say, you need this. There are enough people who think they need that. And that's what the marketing strategy is, is that it always tells you you shouldn't be content. Humans are by nature greedy. Evolution has shown us that. As long as this mechanism doesn't become too dominant, it serves the goals of the individual perfectly. Today, I go so far as to say it's a symptom of an illness. I wonder if we're a viable form of life. Maybe we're just an evolutionary flash in the pan and we'll be sitting right next to the dinosaurs at the Cockroach Museum. Why are we like this? We're caring and compassionate, but we're also egocentric and reckless. We give and we hoard. We create and destroy. What is our problem? What drives us? I went in search of answers. Humanity's at the crossroads. I think a historical moment. The physical environment is undermined to the point where we need to attend to it. War is something that we ought to think about. Well, why does that happen? People are pervasively unhappy. On top of all of that, we keep building Walmarts. I see insatiable greed uh, as inextricably connected to all of these other difficulties that if we don't recognize and come to terms with, we're literally putting our species at risk. <laughs> you know, you might ask to talk about Darwin. Well, if you're asked to talk about Darwin, it has to be about evolution. Evolution is an idea that Darwin is trying to understand. And what's his strikingly original proposal? Natural selection. So <laughs> Humans are, on the one hand, very similar to all other forms of life in that we share a basic biological predisposition, you know, towards survival. But on the other hand, we're so smart that we actually recognize that we exist. 
And the point here is that being alive and knowing it is grounds for great joy. On the other hand, it also carries a very terrible existential burden. If you know that you're here, you know that someday, like all living things, uh, that you won't be here. If that's all we thought about, uh, I'm gonna die, I may walk outside and get hit by a meteor, we would literally be paralyzed by abject terror. What human beings did is to construct and maintain what the anthropologists today call culture. And all cultures offer some recipe for immortality, either literally through the heavens and afterlives and reincarnations of all the world's great religions, or symbolically through the belief that some vestige of our identity will persist over time nevertheless. That's why you want to have children. That's why you want to build pyramids. That's why we want to write great books and symphonies. That's why we want to have a lot of money. Human beings are motivated to have a lot of stuff because psychologically speaking, it gives them a sense that they may be able to live forever. desire, greed, and the struggle that l brings about anger and aggression, from the philosophical, Buddhist philosophical perspective, are all resultant states of a person consistently trying to look at what is not true. We talk about three fundamental truths, that things are impermanent, Secondly, the fundamental principle of everything is said to be emptiness. But now what happens is we try to build something that makes us forget about this. We try to make things permanent. And that struggle creates the third truth of this suffering. We begin to then hang on to things. I'll give you an example. You know, if I have a shirt, and every time I go out to do some shopping, you buy another shirt. You may have 12 in your closet, but you'll buy the 13th, just so that you have a sense of you live long enough to wear all 13 shirts, or perhaps even more than that. So there's a sense of every day consistently doing something because of which we may be able to more solidify our sense of immortality, our sense of living continuously, not changing. And that struggle consistently builds up all these neuroses and the prominent one of them becomes the greed. Death is a very real physical phenomenon, and it doesn't matter how good your symbols are, your religion, your politics, your money, they're still symbols, and none of them will be sufficient to minimize death anxiety, or rather to eliminate it. You can reduce it, but you can't get rid of it. And then finally, just really to make matters worse, we also don't like the idea that we're animals from a starkly biological point of view, we're not all that much more significant or enduring than lima beans or armadillos. An animal takes only what it needs, but the human animal is different. More than seven billion of us populate the planet. 
And each of us desires something, desires more. Is this perhaps the secret of success? We've now developed instruments to measure greed as a personality trait and also to elicit a state of greed in people. This is the balloon task. We use it to measure our test subject's willingness to take risks. The subject has to try to keep inflating a balloon. The larger the balloon, the more it's worth. In each round, the subjects play for real money. Every time they inflate the balloon, they're risking that it might burst, and then their money would be gone. We've been able to demonstrate that people who tend to be greedy are more likely to take risks when performing this task. So they inflate the balloon further than do normal test subjects. And we see that people who tend towards greed also demonstrate an altered brain response. In this graphic, we see how our brain responds to rewards and to punishment. So far, we've been able to demonstrate that the more greedy the test subject, the weaker are the punishment signals. What is interesting is that these people also tend to want to maintain that state. The classic experiments of Olds and Miller on the brain's dopamine system are very interesting in this respect. If electrodes are implanted in exactly this region of a rat's brain, and the rat is then put into a situation where it can stimulate that dopamine system directly by pressing a lever, the rats will continue pressing the lever until they die. And this is presumably one of the biological mechanisms that helps explain excessive greed. Oh, you can have two, okay. Where'd Lily go? You already have two. Come here. Most primates are highly social, but these guys are atypical in that they're also highly tolerant. There is a hierarchy, and everyone knows who's on top, and the individuals at the top get more. Males get more matings, females get more access to resources, but you don't have this really steep hierarchy where there's one individual at the top who gets everything. Um, and you also see some things that you don't necessarily see across the primates, like respect for possessions. So we can look, for instance, at how do you respond when you get more and I get less? Or how do you respond when you get less and I get more? And that's tractable to study experimentally. guys. How are you? So the experiment itself is very simple. You take two monkeys or two apes, um, sit them next to one another, and you interact with them sequentially. And what they have to do is a very simple task. So we give them a token, they return it, and give them a food reward for having completed it. But then the critical component is, how does this individual respond to that medium preferred food, like a cucumber or a piece of bell pepper, when their partner gets something much better? Nala, there you go. See this? That could be due to inequity. It could be due to, hey, look, my partner got something better than me. Or it could just be due to general sort of greed, for lack of a better term. Hey, there's a better food out there and I want it.
from an evolutionary perspective, the behavior that we consider greed, which is acquiring as many resources as possible, is important. Most animals live more at the margin than modern Western humans do, so not acquiring as many resources for them is a real risk of death. In human societies, though, my perspective is that greed has taken on not just acquiring as much as possible, but acquiring as much as possible explicitly at the expense of other individuals. And I don't think that that's something that you can apply to animals. One day, Narcissus came upon a spring that was so clear that he could see himself in it, as if in a mirror. When he saw his own reflection, he fell in love with its beauty. We too like to see ourselves as the center of the world. The individual is now the measure of all things. And so we yearn for recognition and self-esteem. We collect relationships, photos and likes, SUVs, shoes, records. Are we like Narcissus? Addicted to our own egos? Being successful in business is an art. And when you have it, you can be able to take things to a level that people would be surprised. How much is the square meter price? Let's not talk about uh, the international price. Let's talk about our price. Yeah, 700 square meters per floor, multiplied by eight floors, multiplied by our local price. 1,000 what? It's 1,000. It's 1,000? Yeah. yeah, it will cost you 5.6 million. Oh, 5.6 million. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd rather deal with those types of figures, because that's exactly what it's going to be. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Huh? I will tell you my philosophy is very simple. There is a thin line separating a businessman and a criminal. Why? Because anything I do, somebody is bound to say I've cheated him. So all of us as businessmen throughout the world, whether it's Bill Gates, it's Richard Branson, we are all viewed as the criminals. But it's because we think beyond other people think. Uh, President Mugabe is my brother. From a European perspective, I would be a nephew. From our African, I'll be a brother. We cannot have a world full of critics. We want their numbers to shrink. There's fewer critics, more doers. That way the world economy will be nice to live in. Uh, welcome to my house. I, I want to show you around as well as the achievements I've had for, for so many years. And uh, yeah, you know, at a school which is near my uh, old offices, they gave me an award for building a school block. And then an organization, Help Us Help Ourselves, honored me for my work for humanitarian reasons. So uh, uh, they gave me this award. Where this award from BEFTA, its main focus is uh, to uh, recognize those who have done a lot of work in human rights, affirmative action, and empowerment issues, uh, you know, uh, internationally. That's me. In here is my main lounge. Where in, if you come in, uh, and friends and family, we are, we, we do meet and uh, toss around and, you know, have conversations of sorts, political, economy, and family. Okay. We will. We. The property has a helipad on top, so when it's cold here, we, did, we do put the heaters. So it really has, you know, heaters over here. And this room is called the Mugabe dining room. If I'm refurbishing this house, this is the only room I don't refurbish because it gives me that uh, sentimental relationship with the president. And uh, yeah, the man that money can't buy.
and this is it. I know where I came from. I came from being a vegetable vendor. My bed was the floor, the granolithic floor. That's where I used to sleep, with a very poor linen blanket that goes beneath me and one on top. And that history is why I want to, you know, be able to show I got to live well. Talk about it. Things like the racetrack and all other forms of public spectacle are of interest to folks uh, for so many reasons. One aspect of the racetrack is gambling. Another part of it is to highlight one's status relative to one's uh, fellow human beings. Somebody is, quote, better, not by how big or strong he or she is, but rather how one dresses, how you conduct yourself, and how you establish that you are richer than, more worthy than, and therefore more immune from death than all of the other folks who surround you. In some ways, this is no different than dominance hierarchies in primates. We love heroes and therefore have become preoccupied with being the best at something, even if it's how many hot dogs I can eat in 10 minutes. In America, we're number one, not in science or literacy or anything important. We are number one in depression, however. How could this be? What you have to do is look at cultural values to see if they're realistically attainable by the average individual. If you're a male, you're basically valued by how much you have. And this is the so-called American dream. If you work hard enough, you can have as much money as LeBron James or Warren Buffett or Bill Gates. But realistically, for every millionaire, there's got to be hundreds of thousands of people working part-time at Walmart without benefits. Same for women, but they have a different cultural burden. We teach women that in order to be beautiful, you have to be ridiculously thin, your breasts excluded, of course. So if I can't floss my teeth with you, you're too fat. And you have to remain perpetually young, which of course is biologically impossible. Wow, we cherish values that are simply not possible to attain. If you say, I want to be true to the world, you got to get rid of all your I'ms. And when I say your I'ms, I'm talking about I'm this and I'm that. I can do this and I can do this. Oh, yeah, I did this last year. Oh, I can do that. Oh, I'm better than him. So all those I'ms, it's egos. There's a lot of people in South Africa both black and white, who carry the ego badge on them and they carry it high as a flag, you see? And, and those are the people who we would see as the, the future bureaucrats of the country. Hey, what's what? What's what? If you are driving into a, a poor neighborhood where you know people are starving to death and you're driving down with your Mercedes Benz, or your Rolls Royce. That is the worst thing you could ever do. Wow. 
driving with this ego to say, I'm better than you. You know, you'll never be where I am. Those people are lost. If I believe I have to assert my ego, the only way I can do that is through greed. I'm forced to constantly incorporate something into myself that lends stability to my ego. Those can be material things, but they can also be spiritual things, for example, ideas like I'm important, for example, or I'm somebody due to money or fame or my title or something like that. Our entire modern world is based on this. Greed destroys people. Why? Because it isolates us. And because greed is something like a drug. The more I have, the more I want to have. Because whatever I have no longer satisfies me. So it's not what I actually possess that satisfies me, it's the constant striving for more. Religion has known for centuries that this drive lies within us humans, but this drive is also our ruin. Since time immemorial, there have been stories of people who could never get enough. People like King Midas. He asked Dionysus to grant him a wish, that everything he touched would turn to gold. But even his food and his drink turned to gold. It seemed he might starve or die of thirst. Gold and riches have always been cast under the spell of omnipotence and a whisper of eternity. What, I ask myself, gives money such a powerful allure? I chose banking as my career. I'm a trained accountant, and I worked with the Julius Baer & Co. RG Bank first in Zurich and then in the Cayman Islands, which is a tax haven. I was promoted to compliance officer, meaning I was the legal conscience of the company. A certain amount of greed is instilled into you. That was true for me too, I have to admit. You start to think only in monetary units. The dollar signs appear before your eyes and in your heart. Then they're there, and they're the only thing that matters. A lot of profit and making sure you don't get caught. That's the way I operated too, of course. In my function as compliance officer, I determined that we had criminal clients. There were names like Bin Laden, there was a Mexican drug boss. It became clear to me that I was working for a criminal organization and that the bank was a participant in tax evasion and fraud. I ended up feeling morally conflicted, then took the matter up with management. We were threatened, and the entire family ended up leaving the Cayman Islands very suddenly. There have been Swiss bankers in the Cayman Islands who have been killed. To an extent, my decision to leave the system was a moral issue. But what was more important, I think, was that I realized the system had turned against me. For example, the threats that were made against me in the Cayman Islands, the way I was fired and then threatened again. The bank would destroy me if I tried to file charges against them. The bank sent private detectives after us. 
I was followed on my way to work. I had to change the route I took to work, change my work hours. The sight of a black car would upset me. I was completely spooked. I even considered suicide. They wanted to drive me crazy. The state prosecutors had all the information, but they did nothing with it. It's a political problem. It would make the criminal clients uneasy. They would realize they're no longer safe and protected either. So with that in mind, the authorities don't go after the bank. No, they go after the man who made the truth public. I spent 217 days in prison. The first 30 days were in 2005 and the rest in 2011. Both times I was in solitary confinement, spending 23 hours a day alone in my cell. There were prisoners who flipped out and started banging against the doors, screaming. Switzerland and basically every country, they protect their golden calves. The golden calf in Switzerland is banking secrecy. That's why no one will ever investigate the Julius Baer Bank, even though the state prosecutors know that Julius Baer had helped deceive the US tax authorities and so forth. For political reasons, the state prosecutors will never investigate any of that. Our question was, how could we create test conditions that would approximate the behavior of a stockbroker, for example? We use functional magnetic resonance imaging to investigate brain activity in our test subjects. We can look deep into the brain, including into the structures responsible for the reward response. Our subjects play a stock trading game and have to decide whether they want to invest a large amount of money or a small amount. Then they get feedback during the game as to whether the share price is rising or falling. We've been able to determine that people who are especially greedy display a more muted response in regions responsible for punishment and loss of money. This mechanism enables a kind of disinhibition Ein Mechanismus, der eine Art Enthemmung ähm, ermöglicht. Based on the assumption that ordinary and average people will be risk averse, it makes sense for the finance industry, which is optimized for outcome, to hire people who are more inclined toward risk. They achieve that with bonuses and with targeted hiring practices. I believe it's just a matter of time before the next finance crisis will hit. When I started hearing about Warren Buffett and Bill Gates' wealth, it was around about the 30, 40 billions, but now it's 70 billion. You know, in life, if you have only a billion dollars, you can be able to live for 273 years and eat or spend $10,000 a day. How many of us live for 273 years? So if you've got a billion, that means you can even spend 30,000 a day because you're not going to last that long. But still, other people make much more. You know, nobody can say, I don't want more. If people like me don't make money, there's no taxes that enables government to function. 
So therefore, people who make money enable things to happen. And I'm one of those people. More growth, more affluence, more contentment. This is the promise of those who mean well with us. And we're only too happy to believe them. We do our part. Are we hoping to buy ourselves happiness? Many Western Europeans and Americans, they no longer really have a firm belief in God, but you have to believe in something. You know, we have these belief systems that reduce death anxiety, but there's always going to be a rumble of panic beneath the surface of consciousness. We're going to take this death anxiety and we got to do something with it. And one thing that we can do is buy a lot of sh By the time you can talk, you have already been pelted with commercial images like the Nike check and the golden arches. We know them subliminally. Our children are growing up in a world that is radically different from the ones that you and I grew up and their brains have been modified accordingly. Manufacturers of consumer goods, they are spending literally billions of dollars to ensure that no child is left behind in the commercial rat race. We're basically, in a sense, no different than amoebas. We are attracted to anything that fosters life and pleasure. And we're repulsed and afraid of anything that threatens that state of affairs. Shoes. Shoes, and there's shoes everywhere, shoes. Sometimes you don't want to let go of something, you keep it. For instance, this shoe, I've never worn it, but I think it's been sitting here for like three years. Still brand new. And it's the same thing with this one. Still brand new. This one, still brand new. This is a designer shoe. I don't want to be limited because uh, in, in the Bible, Genesis says you must have dominion over everything. That gives me that strength. Yeah. Nobody in, in the Bible, I can open it for you, nobody is poor. Abraham, Moses, everybody is <laughs> a rich man in the Bible. The Bible does not talk about poverty. The Bible is the biggest money machine. Every verse, each verse talks about money. That is something that people need to realize. And um, I'm happy that there's something like this. I'm uh, I've been doing physical work. I think the key for the material society is that it'll always tell you that there's something missing. You need something else. We're all contributing. I don't think it's only the, you know, you can't just blame someone who's trying to sell you something. So demand and supply. You know, we're all sort of supporting each other in it. And we've all gotten into this cycle that we are unable to find ourselves free from. Talking about 24 hours, I would say 23 hours and 55 minutes. Samsara is saying, come, you're missing something. And by Samsara, I mean, the habitual patterns. And you keep thinking, they're calling me. Samsara is calling me. I need to go there, have a car, have a house, have a partner, be busy, be neurotic. You know, that's what I would say. Of course, you don't call it that way. You call it, you know, being someone, being capable, 
finding your identity. Where there is discontentment, you're always looking for more, you're always looking for more. That struggle brings about so much insecurity and unhappiness. One of the reasons why people acquire so much is because it feels good. There are both neurochemical and psychological feedback loops. It causes you to continue doing it well beyond what you actually need. It's one thing when you go out and get a cup of warm coffee on a cold, rainy day. It's completely another thing when you buy a you know, 75th pair of shoes. You really, really don't, in any stretch of the imagination, need those shoes, but they're still gonna make you feel good. There is this drive to, as we say in the US, keep up with the Joneses. In our wealthy set on Park Avenue, everybody's 16th birthday party, Last year, everybody handed out iPods. Well, this year, we're going to hand out iPads. Well, this year, we're going to do this. And so there's also this um, sort of ratchet effect. There's nothing wrong with being a consumer. I mean, to stay alive, we have to consume things. But then we literally surrounded ourselves with stuff to the point where we become imprisoned in a gilded cage. We became consumed with consumption. We're going to keep buying stuff until the last drop of petroleum has been burned. It's very ominous, I would argue.